Tonight, Sandy, Tony and Vanessa continue their battle to free themselves from prescription pills, alcohol and crack cocaine. There's a whole new life waiting for them if they can only win their fight to get clean. Good evening. Welcome to Britain's deadliest addictions. Three addicts on three different drugs. One legal, one prescribed, one is against the law. But which one is hardest to beat? We'll be seeing how difficult it is for an alcoholic to give up the booze compared with a crack cocaine addict and a woman hooked on prescription pills as they try to quit side by side. Now, they're prepared to share their time here with us live in the hope that their experiences may help others facing the same challenges. Tony, Vanessa and Sandy are all on the brink of a new life, but getting there is hard. So we've come to Harrogate, to a hospital that specialises in treating addictions, and we've got this purpose-built clinic in the grounds, staffed by doctors, nurses and therapists to help them get clean. First, let's find out why our patients are here. And we'll start with Tony, who's already begun to leave his life of alcoholism behind. It's like a roller coaster ride. From the moment I wake up, the first thing I reach for is one of these. That's the vodka. And then it dominates my day. His heavy drinking has led to an ultimatum from his wife. Stop or I'll leave you. My worst fear is that I'll lose my family. Who would want to lose Sandra? She's actually stuck up with me for nearly 25 years. She's my rock. Whilst going through a painful divorce, Sandy was prescribed diazepam for anxiety. That was over 30 years ago, and she's been addicted ever since. It's a tranquilizer. And for me, it's a bastard. And I hate it. But I can't remember what it's like not to have to take a tablet to get through the day. It's not stupid. I don't know who I am anymore. 31-year-old Vanessa has been taking Class A drugs since her teens. Six months ago, she started taking crack cocaine. When I first started using crack cocaine, um, I was using ten, uh, 20 stones. As your addiction grows, um, I was doing, say, about £400 worth of an evening. I will come out of this course clean, and in two years, I see myself going to university. Now, Vanessa, Sandy and Tony are living in the clinic, which is right next door to our studio, and it consists, very simply, of three bedrooms off this central lounge area. Now, each of the patients has a clock outside their room, which marks a very important time. For Tony, it shows that it's two days, 12 hours and 35 minutes since his last drink. For Sandy, uh, over here, it's how long since she had her last full dose of the prescription pills she's addicted to. And for Vanessa, uh, the longest time, actually, nine days, five hours and 26 minutes since she last took crack cocaine. And these clocks are a constant reminder of what each of them has already achieved. Now, with me here throughout the week is addiction psychologist Dr John Marsden. Tonight we'll be discovering the effects of their drug use has had on the bodies of Tony, Vanessa and Sandy and finding out why addiction is such a powerful disease. So, it's their third day in the clinic. Let's find out how they got on last night. It's a quiet night for Tony and Vanessa, but Sandy's finding it hard to manage her anxiety without her full dose of prescription tranquilizers. It's only been the second day, and I just want to go home. I want to go home. The following morning, Tony reaches a milestone in his struggle to give up drinking. Are you ready? Yeah. Hooray! Yay! Don't worry, Tony, it's a major achievement. 
Later, he's visited by consultant psychiatrist Dr. Vincenti and staff nurse Kirsty Pepper to discuss his progress. It's very rare for patients who come here not to put weight on because we pride ourselves in the cooking, really. Yeah. But obviously you're struggling a bit with some foods and with your pancreas not being so right you, and your digestive system having gone to sleep, really, yeah. um, for quite some time, you're going to have to work with the nursing staff towards building up mm. um, more solid food yeah. and more of it bit by bit. What yeah. you can't do is try and cram tons down no. in one go because you'll just be sick and feel yeah. awful. I was just going to say that to you. If, if I... If yeah. there's too much in front of me, mm. I don't want you to eat it anywhere. No. no. Mm. I think that you need to do some work on, a lot more work on alcohol and how you're going to keep off it when you go home. Yeah. It's dead easy to stop drinking, it's not so easy to stay off it. No. If you carry on drinking, it's just going to worsen. Now, what will be the consequences of that, do you think, for you? Um, I'll probably die. The liver will, in the end, pack up, won't yep. it, really? And, and if that has to happen, you, you know, you, you need a transplant or you die. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is if I don't quit properly, I might as well just... Well, I wouldn't quite advise that. No, but you know... But you, might, you, know, but you are doing the same. That's just a figure of speech, yeah. Yeah, you're doing, yeah. you know, basically speaking, you know... Um, yeah. Another thing that I sometimes say to patients is a little bit... A little bit cruel in one sense, but I, mean, I don't know if you've got any pension provision because you won't collect it if you don't do something about this. You'll mm. not reach a normal retirement age. No. Really, and um, that would be a shame. Mm. Because you said to me that you were very fond of your granddaughter, and I guess she's fond of you. I can see that gets to you, mm. but you know she's perhaps a bit too young to attend your funeral. <laughs> you know, yeah. little girls need their granddads. Sorry. It's okay. You know. Mm. Yeah. She's coming down tomorrow. She? Yeah. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, she wants to see lots of you and you want to see her grow up. Yeah. But, you know, she's two and a half now. Yeah. Well, you know, in another 14 years or so, she'll do her GCSEs and it'd be nice to sort of share the results with her granddad. Yeah. But she won't be doing that unless you do something about this. Right. I thought it might say as much. Mm. So. I hope that makes some sort of sense. Makes a All lot right. of sense, yeah. A lot of sense. With this amount of damage, there is no way you could ever return to controlled social drinking. No. All right. No, because I've tried that before, and it mm. just leads yeah. back to yeah. you know, square one. Yeah. yeah. Most people with this degree of damage um, can never return to controlled yeah. drinking there's a sort of one in six chance, the figures aren't accurate, but roughly one in six chance that people with early alcohol problems can return to social drinking. Yeah. But that's like playing Russian roulette to you, because yeah. you did this, yeah. you know, with five bullets and one spare chamber. Yeah. You know, five times out of six, yeah. that goes wrong. Mm. You've tried to return to controlled drinking, yeah. it's just not worked. And the same thing will happen again. If you do, yeah. you'll just end up back where you are very quickly, indeed. Yeah. Well, Tony's psychiatrist, Dr. Gareth Vincenti, is with me now, and a very powerful stuff. Uh, I mean, do, do you find that shocking patients works? Uh, what we're trying to do here, um, the important point, is we're trying to get him to uh, have pause for thought so he can begin to mull over in his own mind the consequences of uh, carrying on this path. Because we're all used to sort of, you know, uh, you know, telling smokers, oh, you're killing yourself and, and all that kind of stuff, and it kind of going over their heads. I mean, what, why do you think... I mean, it seemed to get through to him, didn't mm. it? Yes, yeah, so what he has to do is weigh up the consequences of what he's doing to offset the euphoria effects of the alcohol um, so he can begin to see that actually the path that he's going on at the moment 
does not meet with his real aims and wishes and his aspirations for his life. And you, you I mean, was it, was it very deliberate that you picked up on his granddaughter that mm. obviously got to him? And... When I first met him, it became clear to, to, to the team and I that he was very fond of his granddaughter. He's fond of her and, and has hopes to see her grow up. How are you so sure that he's going to die? I mean, what's wrong with him? He, he's got significant damage to his liver. Um, we know that from the, from the blood test results. And then tomorrow, we're going to ask him to go undergo an ultrasound scan and we can examine a, a bit more of the anatomy of the liver as far as the ultrasound scan will reveal. Um, and that will tell us a little bit more as well. We know his pancreas has been under-functioning uh, and he's had acute attacks three times already in recent years. We know he's uh, underweight. Um, his body mass index is low. Um, it's as low as uh, certainly early stage anorexia. Um, so what, what would kill him if he carried on? Um, if he carries on, the likely cause of death, in all honesty, will be the pancreas will flare up and acute pancreatitis can be fatal. And, and what about his heart? Because that, that ends up being an issue as well, doesn't it? As far as we know at the moment, his heart, actually, his heart function is not too bad. There's no great concerns for us there and his blood pressure is under reasonable, reasonable levels. And to what extent do you think you got through to him in terms of that, that message? I mean... Well, I, I think, as the clip shows, it's given him pause for thought. You can see from the emotional reaction that, that we've touched on, on, on some buttons there. And what we'll do in future therapy is build on that and help him to see those things for himself and put that into the equation so he can make a choice. It's no good me telling him to stop drinking because uh, he, he's got to decide. But he's only going to decide to change his behaviour when the consequences in his mind outweigh the advantages. OK, Dr Pincenti, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, well, after the break, we'll be getting Tony's reaction to his talk with his psychiatrist and hearing about Sandy's anxiety. And I feel completely useless and lost and I don't know what to do. I know it's cut my diary from down, but not by much, but everything else has been cut out that I used to take at home. Mm. Welcome back to the clinic where Tony, Vanessa and Sandy are fighting for new lives free of drugs. And Tony is with me now. Now, Tony, we saw that footage of you talking to Dr Vincenti yeah. earlier. Mm. Uh, you know, and he, he absolutely didn't pull his punches with you, did he? He was no. very, very direct. Not at all. He gave me gamma JT results, which were, I think, 25 times higher than they should be. And he's, he's sort of said, look... This is the blood test that the, shows the, that your liver isn't is, functioning. ..isn't functioning properly. And it, it's just so I was shocked to see that, that score. Was... Uh, but it was the stuff that, you know, where he was saying, have you got a pension? Well, that's a waste of time. Yeah, cos I'm, I'm never even going to get there, you know, if you know what I mean with Well, the, how did that pension. make you feel? Cos it seemed to really affect you. Yeah, it affected me badly because it's going to leave my family without any support or anything. Um, you know, my wife and kids need a husband, my granddaughter needs a granddad, and it really sort of hammered it home to me. Um, but, I, I mean, I'll tell you what I thought watching that, which is, which is, has that not occurred to you all these years? Yeah. And it was but, almost as if it hadn't occurred to you before that this was going Yeah, I just seemed to black it out with a drink, though. Um, it's, it's a strange thing, is alcohol. It, you just seem to think about it at one stage and then the next thing you're in the bottle again and, and you forget these things. And now, but, I mean, you've been sober, what, for, well, two, two and a half days now. Um, yeah. Are you, I mean, is the cloud lifting? Are you seeing this clearly now? I'm seeing it, seeing it clearly now. But what I'm seeing is a clock going upwards and I don't want to see the clock coming, counting down on me, if yeah. you know what I mean. Because I've got too much to lose with my family and that. I don't want to lose it. That's a big encouragement, though, that, isn't it? I mean... It is a big encouragement, yeah. Every, every minute that goes on yeah. there. The girls in there give me a clap today when it came to two days, mm. you know, without, without a drink. And that is a good thing, you know. It does uplift you, makes you feel a lot better. And it has given me a bigger incentive to, to quit the alcohol. It's, it's, it is hard work, but the treatment I'm getting from this place... It, it's helping. Good. Well, I'm sure there's loads of people watching who are wishing yeah. you the best. And yeah. Uh, well, I don't, to see any, I don't have to see anybody go through what I'm going through or what I've been through. Yeah. So if it can help anybody, 
the whole world in good. All right, well, uh, thank you very much indeed um, for that. Now, we've started to get to know Sandy as well over the last couple of days, but now's a chance to hear more of how her addiction to prescription pills began. I'm Sandy. I'm 59 years old. And for most of my adult life, I've been stuck on some sort of tranquilizer. I'm a junkie. Although she's never taken any illegal drugs, Sandy is totally dependent on a cocktail of prescription pills, including the potentially addictive diazepam. You know, you're reading papers and it's on television all the time about heroin dependency, cocaine, crack cocaine, ecstasy. And I think, how can people do that to their bodies? And I think about myself, and I'm no different. I'm a drug addict, and I'm ashamed. Whilst going through a painful divorce, Sandy was prescribed diazepam for anxiety by her GP. That was nearly 30 years ago. She's been addicted ever since. It's a tranquilizer, and for me, it's a bastard, and I hate it. But I can't remember what it's like not to have to take a tablet to get through the day. Isn't that stupid? Sandy keeps a daily diary to record her medication. This was in August. I'm very hot and uncomfortable. Five o'clock in the morning, headache tablets and a whole day. I went to bed. 2.20, another whole day. And I managed to go throughout that day and just take a half a day at night. But I think I may have fooled myself by not writing in because I couldn't have lasted that long. I can't do this anymore. I can't do it anymore. She's shocked by the level of her addiction. But it comes as little surprise to her husband, Arthur. Sorry. It doesn't seem, seem to show that much bad, does it, when it's just half a day here and half a day there, or one here and one there, but when you add them all up, if you think over oh, the years, how many sodium tablets I've taken half of? It's probably uh, one thousand. It's probably more than my weight. Come on, come sit down. <laughs> so I know what you're taking. Well, I don't add them up, but I know what you take, don't I? Because you always leave the empties out Why on the side. Why don't you tell me I'm taking too much or anything? It's not what you want to hear, is it? Nobody explained to me what these tablets were. Nobody explained to me what they did to me. How long I would be on them. How to come off them what to experience if I was on them or wanted to come off them. There was nowhere to go for help. The drugs no longer help with her anxiety. Rarely going out, Sandy is now virtually a prisoner in her own home. Her anxiety is so bad, even an unexpected visitor can send her spiralling into panic. Somebody's just drawn up in a car. Yeah. Don't let him in, Arthur. I don't know if somebody's going to come in the house that I don't know, and I don't want anybody in here because this is my safe place and I feel crap, OK? It gets me here because I hate to see her like that. Um, I feel helpless. I want to help, but depending upon her mood, sometimes she'll let me in, sometimes she pushes me out. I know this, and I know that she doesn't mean it. It's just that moment. But, yeah, it turns me inside out to see her like this. She depends totally on the diazepam, 
whereas she can function without me. She looks on me to keep her happy, to love her, to care for her. The diazepam can't do that. But I can't stop the churning tummy. I can't stop this feeling of dread, of fear, of panic. Although she would dearly, dearly love to give them up, she's scared. She's terrified. I just wish she wasn't taking them at all. Um, I just wish that we didn't have them. For the past 30 years, Sandy's lived her life through a haze of tranquilizers. All she wants is to be rid of the pills and enjoy the things most people take for granted. I can look outside and see the sun shining and I want to go out there and embrace it all. And I can't. That's not a life for anyone. It's an existence. I've wasted so many of my years depending on these tablets all the time. I often know me without taking a tablet. And what on earth has that done to my body? And my brain? My feelings? My life? I don't know who I am anymore. And there's Sandy's clock, so two hours, no, two days, nine hours and 52 minutes since her last full dose of diazepam. Well, Sandy's husband, Arthur, who you saw there, is, uh, is with me now. Thank you very much indeed for coming in to talk to us. Um, that number on the clock there, what, what does that represent to you? I mean, that's a big achievement, isn't it? Yes, it is, yes. It's something that I haven't seen for quite a while. Quite uh, scary. Because you look at, uh, at, at that footage there of, of her at home and you see yeah, how... increases me. ..how anxious she is. I mean, and how, how, how anxious about strangers she is. Yes. And you think, well, how is she coping with even being in a clinic at all? Good question. Um, she's climbing the wall, but she's not telling you. She's panicking. But she's, she's made the clinic a safe zone and she can function in her safe zone. How, how, I mean, how, how can you tell she's climbing the wall? Because you've been in to see her today, haven't you? Yes, I have, yeah. Um, she's a little bit fidgety, a little bit sort of edgy. Pleased to see me, obviously emotional, upset, pleased, you know, that sort of situation. But what I have noticed today is a bit of a serenity about her. She's definitely calmer. She seems dedicated to do this thing. I think she wants it so badly. Um, the journey up was quite frightening. Uh, several times we nearly had to turn around. Um, when we left home, I said to her, if you don't want to do this, I promise you I won't make you. We got to the Harrogate sign and she said, Arthur, take me home. I need to go home now. I said, to her, I said to her, we've come this far. It's only around the corner. Why don't we see what it's like? Go and have a look. If you still don't like it, OK, we walk away. And you've seen... I'm pleased with that. I'm really, really pleased. Your, I mean, your, your patience is incredible, actually, uh, to watch. Um, are, you, are you now at the stage, having seen this, that you're, you're daring to hope that way this is going? I dare to hope, but I don't expect... Um, it's been a long time. I, we met in 1982, had a short courtship, and then we got married within three months. But she was taking tablets when we first met. So, yes, she's been taking tablets all the time I've known her. Um, can I just say that on Friday we've been married 25 years? We well. got married the same day that Channel 4 started. <laughs> well, there's an anniversary. How's that one? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Arthur, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Pleasure. Um, now, as we've seen, anxiety is a big issue for Sandy and it's something she's been struggling with while she's in the clinic as well. I think... I don't know how to do it. I can't do it on my own. This is what's getting to me. Everybody's really kind, but if you don't have an S, and I'm not saying it's like if you're not sitting here with cancer or something, it's very difficult to 
understand why I can't do certain things without asking for help all the time. And I feel completely useless and lost and I don't know what to do. I'm not much cut my guys if I'm down or not by much, but everything else has been cut out that I used to take at home. Mm. You understand that, don't you? Yeah. That safety. Yeah. It's a safety thing. It's a dignity thing. Why can't I have a couple of centaur? Why won't you give You'll me... You'll be seeing Dr Labinjo today, and now's your opportunity to talk to him about it again. Now that all the admission and he's got all the history, it's time for you to sit down and say, I need to check out with you why. I mean, I know it's got codeine in it, but... I was asking me to just cut it out completely, just like that, mm -hmm. and that's difficult. Mm -hmm. And Sandy's consultant, Dr Francis Labinjo, joins me now. Now, a lot of people are going to be watching this thinking, hang on a minute, diazepam is supposed to relax you. And here we have somebody who's taking a lot of diazepam and is really, really anxious. Yes, in, in the ideal world, uh, diazepam should only be prescribed for a limited period of time and then to be supplanted by other forms of anxiety management, such as, uh, such like uh, psychotherapy, or even alternative medicine. So it just doesn't work for her anymore as an anxiety control? Un un unfortunately, yes, because she would need increasing doses of diazepam to achieve the same effect. So in, in what's called tolerance to diazepam. Now, the, the other thing with Sandy, of course, is that she has got multiple sclerosis. Now, does that complicate matters at all? Not at all, in the sense that, um, obviously, stopping diazepam suddenly will may well flare up the multiple sclerosis, but this program, uh, treatment program, should not affect it in any way at all. Because you can't take her off them suddenly? No, she, she she's, on, she's on a gradually reducing dose? She is on a gradual dose reduction program. Now, the, the other thing I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be thinking is, now here, here's, here's some, but she's, you know, it's not like she's buying these things on the street. Mm. Um, this is prescribed medication that she's been prescribed for nearly three decades. Yes. Um, is, is it common? to find patients in this position? It is prevalent. It is, um, the, the, the practice is widespread because what we now know, we did not know 30 years ago. And unfortunately, things like psychological therapy have not expanded to the same extent. There are still long waiting lists to get onto those lists. Because I should say, we did contact Sandy's current GP who's only been treating her for a year and he said that her long-term diazepam prescription started 27 years ago when it was much more acceptable to treat patients with this type of drug. I think that's what you're saying. Yes. Um, because there weren't the more modern antidepressant medications available and he considered it clinically appropriate to continue with her prescription. Now, uh, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Lavinja. Uh, now, our other addict, Vanessa, is trying to give up crack cocaine, and she's not been suffering physically as much as Sandy and Tony, but psychologically, the strains are starting to show. Do you know what? I'm, I'm feeling really negative today. I just feel really depressed. I just feel like crying. And... I, know, I know. Look at those nails, how gorgeous they are. <laughs> <laughs> Look in the mirror. Look at you. Thank you. So how yeah. beautiful you are. I know. Not. And your life. Your life. <laughs> I'm going to so I can taste the right time. Maybe you got us here too. And when you are stressed at home, if there ain't anybody there, you can email me. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just want to say exactly how you feel. Yeah. Rather than just pretend to be joking. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. I'm glad you're here. No, I'm not glad you're here. Yeah, I am glad you're here. I'm glad you're here too, hon. I am. I just feel pissed off. Don't know why. Later, Vanessa receives an unexpected phone call. Yeah, Mum, my Mum, you've done that to me all my life, darling, and look, I'm, I'm... Yeah, but no. No. See? I know. Hello? I hope I'm not the only one that's got a mum like that. Yeah. Yeah. She's... 
still sitting there phoning me up. I was like, are you fucking stupid? Can you not hear what I'm saying? Yeah. She shouldn't do that. I would no, never, ever do that to my daughter. Ever. Now, let's go back to basics a bit. John, uh, as an addiction psychologist, you specialise in this stuff. Can you explain to me what is addiction? Well, Christian, th there's an obvious sense in which it's a complex behaviour, but you can also uh, define it broadly as a, as a compulsive desire to take a drug. In fact, a re in a sense, a response to a desire in spite of physical, psychological and social consequences. Clinicians distinguish between physical dependence, which is where if, if the person is deprived of a regular supply of drugs, the body goes into withdrawal, physical symptoms, and also psychological aspects, which, which really relate to, a, if you like, a cluster of alterations in the way we think, memories change, desires become progressively more intrusive, and there's a real strong compulsion to take the drug. And, and addiction develops, I mean, changes as it goes? I always think it, it, it's almost inconceivable to work out when you talk to somebody how they could have ended up where they are now. No one sets out to become addicted. And if you sort of rewind the clock back to the beginning, the, the reasons for taking drugs relate to what? Heightening or dampening of experience, but there can become a cycle of wanting to use, using, recovering that goes on endlessly. So if you take our three different addicts, three very different drugs, what, what, how, do, how are the addictions different? Well, I think we've seen very clearly already that we've got, for example, in the case of, of Sandy, um, a, a, an initial uh, effective response to medication, but now this awful situation, which until very recently, she, you know, it was impossible for her to imagine to come off. Tony, on the other hand, is as far away from a social drinker as it's you know, possible to imagine. And I think, as we've just seen with Vanessa, most, most clearly, this cluster of psychological symptoms uh, that relate to this strong desire to use that, that just overrides any other consideration. OK, thanks very much, John. Um, when we come back, can the human body recover after years of this kind of abuse? Welcome back. Now, earlier today, consultant psychiatrist Dr Francis Labinjo had a session with all three patients. OK, and you were saying about the shakes as well. That's fairly steady, you know. But there has been times when I've been... Yeah. ..when I've not had a drink for quite a while. I noticed that you're shaking a little bit more because they're obviously lessening your medication, which means you're dealing with the withdrawal yeah. more fiercely yeah. for... And that yeah. means it's going down and down and down, yeah. which is a real improvement, I see, cos I know the signs cos I've been through it. Say, for instance, like the heart, Cocaine affects the heart. It increases the amount of work. It's like turning on the energy. So oh. the heart is going bumpity, bumpity, bumpity. And that is really the, um, the, the, the thing about it. It just makes the heart work so hard. And then when it works so hard, it starts getting bigger. Because in order to push the same amount of blood, then the heart gets enlarged. I've always known that, you know, it's, it's, I always know that my heart's gone... Mm. <laughs> like when, that, yeah. the, the, the rhythm becomes chaotic. He just... Yeah, and I'm always Irregular. Like that. Did I tell you something about crack and alcohol? You know mm. that if you take two drugs, you get a third. Alcohol combines with cocaine in the body right. to form a third drug. It's called cocaethylene. Okay, what? Cocaethylene. So you buy two, you get the third free. Alcohol lasts a short while. Cocaine lasts a short while. Cocaethylene lasts 36, 48 hours. And it is a stimulant. And it, it does cause people to be very paranoid. Yeah. You would imagine um, things. You'll be convinced they are real. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's what I did think. In a strange way, <laughs> do you know that benzos can do that? Do you sometimes feel that it can numb you completely? If yeah, I take enough, yeah. Yeah, and you can just be so unfeeling. Because of the length of time I've been taking benzos yeah. in one form of an, or another. Yeah. And I also drank in between. Mm-hmm. Not at but the same time. But it wasn't over long. OK. It wasn't over a long time. I've just, for 30 years, mm. been putting these pills into my body that leave an afterlife. Mm -hmm. Does that keep just building up? 
long term, some of the, uh, they can have long term effects. Like? Yes. Um, like memory things, especially. What about um, my physical body? No. It, it, it's just um, a lot of the effects of the things they can have in common, they all impair judgment in one way or the other. Yeah. They all impair memory in one way or the other. <clears throat> and um, the, the responses to them are impaired as a result. Now, throughout the week, we're comparing how these drugs have affected our three patients. And with me now to talk about the impact on the body is forensic pathologist Anthony Buzatil. Good evening to you, Anthony. Hello. Let's start, first of all, with alcohol. Now, we've been seeing and hearing how alcohol has really affected our patient Tony's health. I mean, what are the problems? Alcohol affects any part of the body that you can, th can think about. It causes generalised problems such as cancer, high blood pressure, skin problems and then even impotence. Okay, now what I've got here, as you can see, is a, a cutaway model of the, the human body. Let's look at the specific organs that are affected. The brain, for example. Okay, let me take that out. With chronic heavy drinking, the brain shrinks. So there'll be major problems in relation to coordination, to memory, in relation to the brain. Okay, let me put this in this box here and stack up the organs affected. What else are you saying? The heart. Okay. Again, problems there. The heart will, will become bigger and it will malfunction and you get things like high blood pressure, indeed, eventually heart failure. Okay, now I guess uh, somewhat behind the uh, stomach area here will be the, uh, the pancreas. Indeed. Pancreas has two main functions. One is relation to nutrition and digestion, so that can be affected, and also insulin production. So if the pancreas affected becomes inflamed and may lead to a life-threatening condition of pancreatitis. Right, now this is a familiar organ here in the, in the centre of the, the cavity. This is the, the liver, an organ that we, we now understood is, is, is likely to be quite damaged in Tony's case. That clearly needs to go in this box of organs at risk. Now, what I've got here is an example of um, liver. Now, it's obviously not human liver, this is pig's liver, but what, what does this tell you? Well, it's a smooth liver, it looks a good colour, it's a healthy looking specimen of tissue. This is just healthy tissue? Indeed. Okay, now, in rather stark contrast, and with uh, the patient's consent, after a, a liver transplant, this was excised liver, this is uh, human liver, but it looks in a terrible state. What are you seeing here? Yes, the colour has changed completely, the liver has become very knobbly, it's become old, scarred, and indeed quite intrinsically damaged, therefore the patient will get liver failure as a consequence. That's advanced cirrhosis of the liver. And this really would be its you know, end stage alcohol dependence? Indeed so. That's quite shocking, I think. And let's, though, move on, bring in benzodiazepines, prescription medications. Now, do these drugs um, affect the organs of the body? No, the only organ which is affected is the brain. There's a change in the chemical structure of the brain, and therefore there'll be problems with anxiety, depression, and a variety of other cognitive problems. And that would build up long term? Indeed, so, yes. OK, another model. Here's another example of the human brain. That's going to go in the benzodiazepine box, obviously, um, but nothing else. Indeed not. OK, last but not least, crack cocaine. What are the organs affected there? Two main organs, the lungs, where you get problems with breathing and indeed very severe damage to the lungs. And the second is the heart and the blood vessels leading to the heart, which may lead to a sudden heart attack, sudden death. Now, now Anthony, lungs because you're inhaling vapour which is in some way corrosive? Yeah. The, the, the vapour which is inhaled in crack cocaine is very hard vapour and that damages the lining of the lungs and the lungs intrinsically. Okay, so it's the whole cardiorespiratory system. Again, more models to, to demonstrate the heart and also the lungs. And any other organ involved? The brain, obviously, again. And the brain will have major alteration in its chemical constitution. It won't function properly, okay. short-term and long-term. That must go into Anthony, many, many thanks. Thank you. Well, what we've learnt from all that is that when it comes to alcohol, the whole body can be damaged, but the key organ that's affected by all of these drugs is the brain, and we'll be looking at that in more detail tomorrow. In part four, Sandy has an emotional reunion with her husband, Arthur. I can't go back to being a woman. I can't seem to find my way back to being a woman. Right. And I can't go find my way back to being his wife. 
Welcome back to Britain's deadliest addictions. Now, therapy is an integral part of the treatment here, and it's also important to involve the families in that. Today, Sandy's husband, Arthur, joined her for a session with therapist Helen Bryant. But first, they were reunited in the clinic. I'm sort of thinking, what is it that you're hoping might come from, you know, Sandy's admission here and uh, the changes suppose, that Sandy's already started mm, making? I suppose we've... We're close, but we've grown apart physically, and I think that's probably one of the biggest mm. areas of contention. Right. Um, she tends to push me away. Mm. And I have to learn to accept it. Mm. And obviously, I'd like that to mm. perhaps improve. I don't know how, I don't know when, but... Mm. Is that difficult for you to hear, or is it something that you feel that you know? Do you think it has something to do with, you know, that what you've experienced with the diazepam? Is that almost taken over? And sometimes do you feel that you're a carer rather than a husband? I love her and I care for her, so mm. as far as I'm concerned, the two go together. Mm. The fact that she might want some help in the toilet doesn't make any difference to me at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She needs me. She's in trouble. I'm there. Doesn't matter. I don't feel a woman then. Right, because of father caring for you in that way. At that point, when, like if he has to help me mm. and dress, if he comes in, he doesn't mean to. <laughs> we'll come into the bedroom after he's been in the bathroom or something and wandering as mm. normal, mm. just as I'm putting my pad on. And, right. Which I have to wear mm. for confidence because of the MS with my bladder. Mm. Mm. And that strips me of all my femininity. Mm. And then from that, I can't go back to being a woman. I can't seem to find my way back to being a woman. Right. And I can't go find my way back to being his wife. Right. I mean, we're not youngsters, but that doesn't mean to say we can't have a, mm. an ordinary or even extraordinary sex life if we want to have. Mm -hmm. I've taken more diazepam, which dampens down my feelings. Yeah. So I've got no libido. Mm -hmm. And although I love him, and I do love you, Arthur, no, you do. No. I can't express my love in that way. Mm. And that hurts me to bits, but I don't go across that line. And I don't know why I don't go across that line. There's no reason why we shouldn't lay together, stroke each other, kiss each other. Mm -hmm. And I don't even do that mm. because I don't feel a woman. Mm. You always look gorgeous, you know that. And I tell you every day, but you don't believe me. But you ev never, ever look untidy, scruffy. You always look beautiful. So why don't I feel it? I don't know. But we have discussed at length the way the tablets affect you, and maybe once you're free of the tablets and some of these other issues might be moved on. I won't say they'll be resolved, because that's too much to expect, but maybe moved on to a, a level that allows you to be yourself. Well, I don't know what that is. No. I'm scared no. to find out. Well, that's the adventure then, isn't it? I'm not far yeah, behind you. Yeah, we told you. it behind the adventure, <laughs> didn't we? Yeah. 
But you can let go, you don't have to worry about. I'm always around, I'm always by. You just be yourself. The bullshit little cow that I've always known. I've got some lessons to learn, I know that. Um, Perhaps we can learn them together. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the family therapy from earlier today. Now, John, we heard yesterday as well that, you know, how important therapy is in terms of trying to achieve a, a change in the mindset of all of these people, which is the only way they're going to actually manage to stay off all of these drugs when they, when they get out of this clinic. I mean, is there any evidence it's happening yet? Oh, I think powerful evidence. I mean, we just saw in that, in that tape emotions that had been maybe long submerged for decades. Just at the end, there was humour surfacing. Um, you know, what more powerful way of healing than to actually see, um, you know, the, a humour in a situation. But the most important emotion, which was perhaps in their instance, long buried, was just their relationship itself, the, the love that they have for each other. And I think one of the things that happens with addiction over time is that important emotions just become deadened, dampened down, shut off, and the person just locks them away and is fearful of actually opening up and, and seeing what lies within these kind of chests of emotions. And what we have seen, I think, is that family therapy, bringing two people together in a, in a safe context for discussion, is a way of just getting motivation rolling for change. But how does it continue? Because, I mean, Arthur himself said that uh, he thinks Sandy has made this a safe place in her mind where she can talk about this stuff and she can think about this stuff. Indeed. And I what... Mean, how, how, you know, how she will, will she keep doing that when she goes home where she's used to having panic attacks and being scared of people outside, you know? It's baby steps, isn't it? What we've got here is a safe haven. We've got a, a, an opportunity for them both to feel the different sort of clinical atmosphere that they have, this place of safety, for them both to stand outside of their home in their bungalow live and experience each other here in this particular environment Arthur visiting. Um, but it is, as you say, it's first steps. It's going to be critically the case that, you know, all those years that have kind of become so tightly woven need to be progressively un unwound. And that's going to take time. All but right, it's a thanks, huge John. step. Let's have a final look uh, into the clinic. Uh, there's uh, Tony uh, with, uh, with some of the nursing staff. What's Vanessa doing? I think she's in her room. She's had a pretty rough day today, and uh, Sandy's in her room too. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow at the later time again, a quarter past 11, with more on Tony, Sandy and Vanessa's battle for a new life. Have a very good night.